Hey, good morning, folks. This is uh, Stan Scrabbit, and uh, with me I have Lieutenant Colonel Mike Carlson and Lieutenant Colonel B.J. Carlson from up in the north and Cody. Uh, apparently they have a little snow up there. And um, the reason that we're getting together this morning is we are going to kind of finish out this ground team member three training and uh, move on to bigger and better things maybe next week. And, um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of excited. Basically, we there's three major parts to this. One is dealing with communications. And <clears throat> what, uh, what we've talked about is basically that's your iCut. iCut will cover all that information. And if you go out and do your training for iCut, then you will have um, what you need. So we're not going to cover it here. Okay, so false advertising on my part. I threw it up there uh, because it was part of the task that we didn't cover, um, but that's all in the eye cut. So um, uh, I'll refund your money. Okay, so but what we are going to do is we're going to talk about uh, doing some DFing, okay, and also line search. And well, with that, I guess we'll just kind of get started. So, um, Colonel Carlson's, which ones do you guys want to start with? Well, I think Colonel Carlson can start with the, uh, the stress peak and berry. And very I'll good, uh, very good. All right, I will be your slide flipper for the day. So, um, we're going to go ahead and share the screen and bring up that DF and make sure that is all looking just wonderful. And is that coming up? Yes. Okay, let me just uh, freeze it on my screen. <coughs> Very good. All right. Colonel Mike Carlson, I turn it over to you. Is there a way to put that as full screen or not? Um, Make life easier. I would no, we've been... Uh, no. I know. No. Okay. So we'll say okay. no. Electronic direction finding, basically we're looking for um, what we call an ELT, emergency locating transmitter, and we use it with DF, so directional finding equipment, and there's lots of different ways to make that work. So if you would. Basically these are uh, set out in planes, what we call the ELTs, and the EPIRBs are meant for uh, ships that are out there. Uh, we don't have too many EPIRBs running around Wyoming, but uh, sometimes it can occur if you get on a big lake and somebody has one. Um, SARSAT and COSPASS receives a signal. That's kind of a satellite, and we'll see that in the next one. If you would, makes life easier with a graphic. So here is what's kind of happening. <coughs> if, uh, let's say we take a little person that's hiking down there and they have a, a personal beacon and they uh, press uh, the button that says, I have an emergency, the signal goes up to some nice satellites and I think they're, what, 120 miles up or something like that? And they'll receive it and then they send... Uh, that signal back to a local user terminal, which, um, sir, where is um, AFRCC? They've moved a couple times now. Are they down in Florida or, or Mississippi? Okay, must not be on. No, I'm on. I'm just, uh, I've got to get off of mute. Um, oh. uh, they're down in, in Florida. Is it Florida? Is it Tyndall or something like that? And uh, they're the central receiving of these signals from the satellites. <clears throat> then once they uh, get that signal and discern uh, the latitude and longitude of that action, they end up calling then, uh, in our case, Civil Air Patrol and other entities within Wyoming. Sometimes the uh, Joint Operations Center, which is called the JOC, 
will get it, or Homeland Security will probably get in on it, which is called woes in this case. And uh, from there we take action and try to send out different rescues. In the case of uh, where you see that little nice little helicopter, they're going out, uh, the Coast Guard would be going out for ships, and if it's on land, then it ends up being the Air Force, and they go out and call us, and we try to make it work. So it's dependent on signals, going to satellites, going to a user terminal, which is basically AFRCC for inland, so that's the Air Force Rescue Center, and then also the Coast Guard if they're going to go out and do the waterways. Next, please. <clears throat> So, uh, basically this explains what I just went through. Uh, they have a lot of acronyms, but we made it simple for you. And the Air Force is not at Langley any longer. They're down, I think, in Tyndall in Florida. And, like I said, they'll end up calling whoever needs it. Is it Tyndall, sir? I'm... <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Why? Next one. <clears throat> oh, as you can see, they have some uh, basic centers that they'll they'll go to uh, for regions type of thing for uh, the Coast Guard, I believe, the waterways and areas. They've got the Alaska, the Hawaii, the, the or the Guam, etc. We're not quite concerned with that because we're inland, unless you're a CAP member on the coastline. Yeah, but these are these are where the SARSAT actually sends the initial signal, and then they get kind of dispersed back over to Langley, for example, or to okay. Tyndall. So this is these are the, the stations that actually read the SARSATs. Okay, I'm and sorry. They pass, pass, and from there they go back. So, so on that previous slide, um, the one with the picture. Slide, yeah, with the picture. Basically, yeah. it goes to a local user terminal right here, and um, yeah, draw an arrow. I can draw arrows. It goes to that local user terminal. Yep. And then it, you know, it works its way over to the rescue, rescue coordination center, whether it's the Coast Guard or AFRCC. So that's that's what those places are. Sorry, but that's all right. Good. Um, yeah, you clarified it better than I did. And it's just important to understand that AFRCC, Air Force Rescue Center, is control of all inland SAR searches. Anything that goes out on the waterways is going to be the Coast Guard. Ah, that was the next slide. So uh, we've just kind of gone over that one. Yeah, just reiterating. Yep. Are we out of order now or not? Nope, we're moving on. Okay. So um, NASA comes in because of the satellites, and NOAA comes in with the satellites for the weather operational systems. That can be looked at. Next. Okay, frequencies. <clears throat> there are some changes in the winds that have been going on for years, years, and years. The distress beacon um, in the aircraft, if it hits a little bit too hard on landing or um, in a crash type of situation would turn on and would produce a signal of 121.5 megahertz. <clears throat> and uh, if you uh, look at the opposite end, the harmonic, which would be double what that one was, would be 243. That one was used for military use. <clears throat> This next generation is actually occurring more often, and it's what's called the 406 signal. And in that case, what they're doing is you have a registration <clears throat> of that unit, and if something happens, 
it's going to send up to a satellite and say, I am this plane, and it's going to grab from one of the GPS satellites its location and call it in. Again, it'll go to that uh, those stations out there, and they'll receive it <coughs> and uh, basically send it to <coughs> the entity, whether it be the Air Force or the Coast Guard. This one can bring the identification and location down to somewhere less than 50 meters using the 406 signal. Utilizing the old frequencies of 121.5, even though it's going to a satellite, it was a general area. <clears throat> and that general area could any, be anywhere from uh, yards to miles. It was not very accurate, but at least got you into the area. The new 406, if done properly, <clears throat> will get you in to a small distance. So um, we have training beacons. Hey, Mike. Um, you know, also with the difference of the 121.5 and 406, if I am correct, is uh, I guess the strength of the signal that goes out the was it 125 or 121.5? Um, you know, you could pick up that signal a lot further than 406. 406 is is more um, uh, basically narrow in its in its cone. Is that correct, or am I off base? Well, you're half and half. My understanding is the um, 406 really we cannot detect unless we have some special equipment and it will burst transmit to the satellite uh, once every X number of minutes. I believe it's something like 10 minutes or something like that. Each manufacturer does it a little bit differently. That burst transmission is nanoseconds for a very small amount of, of time. So to detect it, you've got to have some special equipment and be able to catch it and once you catch it then to have the equipment analyze it and pick off the signal with the direction in it. <clears throat> it's of uh, voltage or wattage is uh, I'd have to I'm not sure about the manufacturer but I'm gonna say five watts the old 121.5 was about approximately 5 watts and then could transmit, like the colonel was saying, in a cone. So you're at the bottom of a, um, around some landform, and, and once it gives off a signal, it's like a cone or, or a shell type of thing of a, like, say, a, a basketball or whatever. you got a dome, and it would give off a signal that would spread out. With the new 406 signal, they also have a 121.5 operation within the unit, but its power is drastically cut down to somewhere about uh, 200 milliwatts or something like that. So the output is, is reduced, and the only reason they keep the 121.5 within the uh, new manufactured stuff is so that we on the ground uh, can get in there and locate it. My understanding is we don't have any hand operations uh, units to go in and detect the 406 signal. The only ones that I know of are in our aircraft <clears throat> and I'm understanding there's a variances of like 20 different not channels but uh, uh, areas that can pick up the signal off the 406 and a majority of our Civil Air Patrol aircraft only have capability of picking up two or three. It just costs a little bit more to get the new generations to pick up the extra uh, 18 or so. Uh, so hopefully National will be working on that. My understanding is we have two aircraft 
within Wyoming that have the extra ability to pick up those extra offside channels of the 406. Okay. Very <clears throat> cool. Sorry, I'll let you go. That's all right. The, the training side of things, well, it's nice to go and put out a signal, but if it's all 21.5, we're going to be in drastic trouble if we want to practice. And everybody will be crying wolf all the time. So what they have done <clears throat> in the past is have an offside frequency. It used to be 121.6. Because of its closeness to 121.5, there was some problems that uh, would filter over into the other channel and people would, again, cry wolf type of thing. We've, we're hearing something. So approximately in 1999, Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, designated training signals to be a little bit further away from the primary signal. And we use 121.775 megahertz. And that's what we're operating now. Some of your units that you have for directional finding may have both the 121.6 or the 121.775. If you get close, either one of those would probably pick it up. But be uh, further away, you would want to stay on the frequency for 121.775 for training. Next, sir. Ah. Yes, as I think I stated before, if you want to be detected, well, they've turned off the uh, 21.5 out of the, their satellites up above. And my understanding, I may be wrong, but when I've talked to certain people, these 24 some satellites up there looking for that signal of 121.5, even though they've, quote, turned it off, uh, I believe is still kind of monitoring, but they don't use it. They would rather you uh, be going to the 406 signal. But however, however, if you have an aircraft that hasn't changed to 406, or um, you know for whatever reason, and they're still on 121.5, um, you know, the from what I understand, airliners are still monitoring 121.5 at times. And, um, you know, it's also good practice to just kind of monitor it uh, just in case you pick up an old, and one of these old-style uh, beacons. Correct. Aircraft frequencies <clears throat> is where this beacon frequency is located, and just about every aircraft that I know of has the ability to monitor 121.5. And in the past well, recent past, within three years, I believe, there has been occasions where the Wyoming Wing of Civil Air Patrol was called out to do a search because the over high-flying aircraft were able to pick up that signal, even though it might have been weak. Next, sir. Yeah, Josh uh, Linscott, um, who's out there, um, he mentioned the ACR Vecta 406 Portable Direction Finder. So, Oh, there is one out there now? Okay. Yep. Something to look at. So thanks, Josh. Next, sir. So as of 2007, we can't use the old 121.6 signal. If you do and you get caught, FAA will come after you and do all sorts of bad stuff to you. <clears throat> so let's, yeah. Ah, these are newer slides than I'm used to. Okay. Choo -choo -choo. Can you go a little? So basically this is uh, setting up the satellite system of where the 406 signal is going to. There is a comparable system to this uh, 406 signal and it's called the SPOT 
technology. And it's for your own personal use. It does about the same thing. And uh, maybe the colonel could talk about this a little bit more than I can because he's he was the one that uh, bought it and, and brought it into uh, the Wyoming wing. Yeah, basically spot. Um, you know, we use spot in our aircraft and also for our ground teams. And basically the, the spot... Um, you know, it has a variety of different modes to it, but the one that we use primarily is a, a tracking mode, and this is to, you know, just kind of reassure us that things are um, still moving along, um, you know, as far as our aircraft flying. So um, on a regular basis, um, every five, ten minutes, it will, the spot device will transmit a signal and that signal will, you know, basically head off the satellites and such. And you can track the progress on a website. And with that website, you know, you can make sure that your aircraft, they're still moving. There's also um, kind of an emergency mode that you can send a signal that you need assistance. Um, that's also available on the spot. But uh, we train our crews to um, uh, use the spot. Uh, so we can track them and make sure that, you know, we're not going to go out and do a search and rescue um, unnecessarily, right? So if they're missing a call in or something, um, one of the first things that we do is to see if the aircraft is still moving. If it's still moving, you know, then then that kind of, um, our comfort level is good. But if the aircraft is is parked somewhere, and the spot is not uh, no longer moving. Um, we at least know where to start our search, so it, it works out quite well. It's situational awareness, not just for the plane, but also for the management side of things. <clears throat> so, because of the uh, SARSAT hits, <clears throat> they show that we've been able to rescue quite a few people inland and on the marine side. Um, these yeah, are, I would say, almost 12 years old records, and we're finding that uh, with the 406 signal, they're able to pinpoint and be able to come up with uh, the basic aircraft a lot quicker. And the spot technology is uh, also... Uh, taking away from some of the older uh, personal beacons, people are going to that. So there's not, there's not going to be as many people rescued via the uh, personal beacon because of uh, SPOT bringing in its technology. Yeah, and, and also this technology, you know, does affect the Civil Air Patrol's missions in doing a search. Um, you know, because in like in Wyoming, the local sheriff is in charge of search and rescue, um, you know, within their areas, and you know, if they get a, if they get notification of a 406 with an exact location, uh, that's where they're going to go, and they're not going to invite Civil Air Patrol to to get into the business. But um, you know, we still have plenty of work out there for us. Um, this has changed what we do, and you know, we just kind of adjust a little bit. So. Still, a uh, good thing is people are being saved, and that's the, that's the bottom line. Exactly. So, again, we get uh, back to the three different types. We talk about the Marine, the EPIRBs, the ELTs for aviation, and the PLBs, which are the land-based uh, personal locating beacons. Next. <clears throat> I think I said this before, the 21.5 is an older technology, but still valid. Uh, it's not being f followed by satellites as long. If people understand in communications there's analog and there's digital, about the only thing I could quickly say about that, analog was a broad-based signal, and digital is a very tight signal. And you can get more digital or digital signals within the same analog uh, band, so that's been helping out. It's also clearer, 
If you had a digital signal, it's going to be real good all the way until it just it just falls off. Analog would be very strong, and then if you get further away, would keep dropping off, dropping off, dropping off until you barely hear it. So uh, sometimes it's good to have the analog signal, but uh, because you can hear it on the lower end. Here they say it's one watt. Sometimes uh, I think that's what the the new beacons are under the 406 when they have the 121.5. It is less than one watt power, more like 200 milliwatts. <clears throat> And the standards I can't talk about because that's FCC, Federal Communications Commission. The uh, accuracy of trying to find a 121.5, it has a tendency to like to bounce off of stuff. And you can have things blocking the signal. Could be a hill, many different things. So it's a little bit harder to find. Um, let's see, only, I guess that gets through that one. Let's see what they've got for the next one. Yeah, and also um, other, other things, as it mentioned, were able to emulate the signal. So there was lots of false signals. Um, we chased, it, chased one down to a television in some individual's house one day. Um, they unplugged the TV, the signal went away. So that, that was... Uh, Quite, quite fascinating. We did the same signal and found out it was a caterpillar um, tractor of some sort on a highway creating a signal and it uh, was and this was the day before they turned it off. So yes, it can be rather hard to uh, find. So the military, like I said, uses not the 121.5, but it's the double megahertz and 243. And that's still, once we get, we don't have too many of those because I guess the Air Force decides that uh, they don't uh, lose their planes quite often. But it took them a while to find uh, an A-10, I think, in Colorado a while back. Next one, sir. Okay, the 406 is new to our technology. It is global coverage, as it said before. It is a digital signal, and the power has been is up to about five watts going to the satellite. Because it's digital, it has rigid specifications, and the accuracy I have been finding out is a lot tighter than two to three mile. Um, the last time we used it, it became within almost 50 meters. Well, they say 100 meters, so uh, we've been finding 50 is good. Next. So this is kind of like, how shall I say, different pictures of how well you can find something. If you were in an aircraft quite high, you would be looking for, uh, that's what it's kind of saying for the 121.5. You're going to get a lot of area to cover. With just the 406 signal, you're kind of narrowing it down. When you throw the GPS in with the 406 signal, you can get it down to within a very small area, like a ball field or park, as they're saying. Makes a difference. Oh, boy. If you, that picture pretty much sums up the array of different transmitters that are out there. All sorts of different ones. Uh, most of the ones that are encased in the plastics you can guess to be the uh, uh, maritime ones. PLBs, personal locating beacons, have been out there for a while. And you can buy them for, I think, what, two or three hundred dollars? And I, Stan, I don't remember being having any case of those things used in Wyoming. Do you remember? No, I don't. I don't know of any. Once it, once again, if if it's a PLB and they, you know, they are able to uh, narrow it down to uh, you know relatively small coordinates, the sheriff just goes out and does it. Right. Yeah, we we haven't get called 
for any of those. Yeah, they they range for anywhere like two hundred fifty to four hundred thirty dollars, okay. stuff like that. And if you pay that much one time, you can use it for as long as the FCC says it's valid. The spot technology. Uh, you buy a certain unit for maybe $150, but then you have to pay a yearly fee to keep it going. With a PLB, you register it, and it's good for as long as you own it. You yeah, and, and I would I would have to say the difference, you know, with the spot and the PLB is the spot you can use any time and every time, um, you know, because it's just communicating back to somebody who knows you're out there. Um, whereas, you know, a PLB... You know, if you activate it, you got a lot of people coming for you. Right. So, so you, you don't you don't turn it on to say, "Hey, I'm here." And my understanding is, some of the newer spot technology, you can communicate with your uh, cell phone and uh, text message people right uh, from your cell phone through spots. So that's kind of nice that way. Let's go to the next one. Uh, to do to do, sir. This one is this the uh, helper? Yeah. Yep, helper. Components. Oh, you have more more uh, more uh, background on that than I do. With the helpers? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so basically, this is just talking about what your uh, locator. Um, direction finder is, is going to have. So it basically consists of a box, has different features. So you have um, uh, a dial, so which indicates the signal strength or direction depending on what mode that it's set in. So, uh, you know, as they indicate, there's uh, three, three modes, DF, REC, or off position. Um, REC, what's that? Receive. Receive, okay. Yeah, usually I have a set in DF, so, okay. And the frequency selector allows you to select which frequency. So that goes back to whether you're looking for an actual one or if you're using a training one. And uh, there's a picture that's coming up. Right. So other things that you have are a sensitivity switch, right? So you're going to adjust basically the, the squelch on it. Um, you know, so you'll, you'll basically tune it until it goes crazy and then you'll tune it down. Um, you know, and, and, <clears throat> you know, so, so you want to keep it as sensitive as you need it to get the right signal. Um, but you're going to, you know, as you closer that you get, you're going to have to keep adjusting this thing. Uh, so it doesn't drive you crazy. Volume control, right? You turn it up, turn it down. Um, you have a speaker on it, which that's where the signal comes out, and then you have uh, a light on for low light conditions. So if you're out there in the middle of the night, um, you can turn that on. So those are those are uh, useful things. What the what this is missing is actually showing a, a picture of it in in use, but uh, it's kind of like a a stick mounted to the letter H. So and, that, and there's some pictures that are coming up. So okay, I, so I they'll be there. Um, okay, so so here is what you have, right? So here are all those different uh, different components that are on this, uh, basically on this box, and <clears throat> so basically, you know, one of the first things that you want to do is is turn it on. So you you go up and you turn, you know, the switch. Let me find an arrow here. All right, so you're going to set this switch, and <clears throat> you're going to turn it from off on to DF, right? And that's the first thing. Make sure it's working. The needle will, will kind of go back and forth. Um, your needle is right here, and this needle will swing. Basically, you're chasing the needle, right? So, <clears throat> so you're going to you're going to kind of rotate. You're going to go around in a circle, right? to watch where this needle goes. And once you've gone in through a circle once, then you start chasing the needle. Uh, and basically, you're trying to get the needle to be centered uh, in this device. 
Over here, this is where you have your different frequencies. Um, basically, you know, as we said, 121.5, that was the actual frequency, and then uh, 121.775 was uh, training, and 243 is military. Um, so you're going to basically turn it to whatever frequency that you're going to be following for the day. Um, you have your, your light switch, right, which will turn on the light, and basically, it illuminates um, the arrows or the um, the meter up here, so that'll glow. Um, here's your speaker, uh, your volume, and then you're gonna uh, so you turn your volume, you turn it up basically, and then you're gonna adjust your sensitivity uh, until you start getting a lot of uh, you know basically a lot of noise, and then you dial it back a little bit. Uh, so you, it's just not having noise all the time. You want the noise when you're actually picking up a signal. And that's kind of what most electronic people know as squelch, I guess they call squelch. it. Squelch, yeah. Now, the other pieces to this, um, you know, and, and they could have done a great job uh, if they just threw up some pictures, but they didn't, um, is you basically have... Um, you know this wooden frame so the the DF box attaches to the bottom of this frame and then up at the top um, it comes out to a T and from there you have some antennas that stick out okay and and we'll see a picture uh, here coming up and so you know you just need to, to kinda of tighten them down a little bit make sure that things are not wobbling and loose and you know that'll help you um, you know, find the signal. So this talks about the antenna crossbar. Let's get to the picture. So, yep. right. Yep. So here you have, um, you know, this this device that we had. So this little box, and it's attached to this wooden frame. And from that wooden frame, you have antennas that come out. Okay. So that's that's kind of what they they look like. I think the best picture is what three more down or so. Is it? Yeah. Cool. We'll get there. Okay. So <clears throat> the way this works is, you know, as I pointed out, you're you're watching this this needle move back and forth. When the needle is centered, the ELT could either be in front of you or directly behind you. Okay, so that's why you have to turn to see which direction. So if if you are, so if you've got the needle centered and you turn to the left and the needle jumps to the left, that means you chase it because it's behind you. If you if the needle is centered and you move to the left and the needle jumps to the right it means that it was in front of you and you need to turn back to the right to keep it centered. Um, this is a lot easier to do um, when you got one in your hand, honestly. This is, um, it, it's stupid easy when, when you're doing it. It's like, oh, so that's exactly what you knew. Um, <clears throat> but basically you turn, you know, you're going to turn this thing. So as I say, you follow the needle, right? That's, that's how this thing works. So you have a signal. <clears throat> this first one shows that the ELT can be front or behind you, wherever the helper is, and that you know it's it's centered towards you. But if you happen to to turn and the ELT is to the left of you, the needle will, will chase to the left. Right? In this and, case, it's a right turn that you're doing. Well, you did a right turn. Now you have to go back to the left right. and uh, to get the needle um, to center again. So that way you know it's in front of you. <clears throat> so this is what this kind of looks like. Um, you know, once again, we have this we have this box that's right there. It's on this wooden pole, and then there's a crossbar, a wooden crossbar that's there. And then finally, you have these antenna. Okay, so 
these uh, these antenna they basically help determine which where the maximum strength of the signal is right? and that that will let you know uh, which direction to go uh, let me express that uh, the Alpers are no longer being manufactured. So if you have one, getting parts to replace it is very, very, very difficult. I would, uh, for portable direction finding for ELTs or EPIRBs, whatever the case may be, I compare this to being like a 16-inch gun off a battleship. It can go for long distances. I belong to Park County Search and Rescue, and when we practice with these, we can actually sometimes get signals 20 miles away. Even though we're kind of in the mountains, we've been able to utilize this system. There are other ones that are out there, which they may mention later on, which are kind of like 5-inch guns off of cruisers or something like that. And then there's one units that are made very close in that uh, would be good if you've got 16 or 20 aircraft all parked together. Uh, it's kind of like dirty fighting in boxing. You can utilize those units to get in and find the actual plane. And we can talk about those a little bit later. Right now we're settled on the uh, helper. Yep, this is uh, one of those five-inch guns that uh, Colonel Carlson mentioned. Uh, basically, this is a very, it's a handheld device, uh, very small, and um, with that device, it, it basically, you know, has these flaps come out, and that's the antenna um, that are able to do this. Um, I'm not married to these, you know. I, I'm used to the the old ones. Have great success with these, with those, and and these. Um, you know, it, it it once again it takes a little while to get used to. And again, it depends on the situation. If you're very long distances, the Alpers are great. Uh, when you get into shorter distances that you're trying to locate something, then the Alper plus these, uh, as they call them, the trackers. Uh, we also have one uh, made by a Canadian unit that looks like an Alper, but handheld, very small. And they work uh, close in. And, but uh, sometimes they're a little bit harder to triangulate or biangulate or triangulate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, how to, how to use one of these. Uh, basically, unfold the antenna. Uh, turn it on. Uh, it will automatically uh, select the uh, the 121.5 channel. So you're going to have to change the channel. Um, so you change it to what whatever frequency that you want. Um, basically, you know, practice frequency and such. Okay. One of the, this one of the things that's really important about doing this is is you do what you're trained to do. So if you always turn it on and you always set it for 121.775, don't forget that in an actual, you have to change the frequency. You can't just leave it at 121.775. Okay, so you have to make sure that you're changing it to the right frequency for whatever the, the scenario that you have going on. This shows basically the different switches. Um, so you have your on-off button and you have your channels uh, that you're setting and and the manual switch switches between automatic and manual sensitivity so with the the manual sensitivity you can adjust that by hand um, otherwise uh, you know just kinda let it do it on its own so. On most of these, I've never really liked the automatic sensitivity. I've just about in every unit I use the manual so I could set it to the uh, highest setting so that you uh, pick up anything and then you can always turn it down. Right. 
And as they say, there are other companies out there making directional finding equipment, and which they don't show. We have in Wyoming is a little yellow box that is held uh, to the you know, by one hand. It looks like an H configuration, and it has some idiot lights. And basically, you hold it out in front of you, and you kind of walk slowly. And it, uh, if the direction says go to the left, you just walk slowly to the left, not drastic changes, and keep it centered. And it will direct you to the unit. Uh, it also gives you the, not sensitivity, but the, um, uh, not loudness, but the, as you get closer, it'll show you gaining lights and therefore knowing that you're getting closer to the signal. Yeah, so it estimates range basically. Yeah, something like that. Roughly, yeah. And again, this is not for long distance. It's basically set up for shorter distances. So what's nice about Civil Air Patrol is we have aircraft that know what they're doing most of the time with uh, ELTs, and they can go out and be on the wider side of the cone of the signal and probably get a ground team in closer to uh, get the signal. Oh yeah, let's. You want to get up to that? Oh, okay. Okay, so with the, with the aircraft, I mean, with the aircraft, this is, you know, it's one of those skills that um, you know it's it's important to develop. It's called wing null, but you can also do it with um, a handheld uh, DF equipment. And basically, what you're doing is you're shielding, um, shielding, you know, part of the signal, um, in order to to help locate it. And this is, um, yeah, you, you're trying to hide part of the signal, you know, kind of block it, so so you know that the signal is coming from in front of you. What and, let me? Uh, what is interesting about the Elper is that. When you start getting in closer with the Alper, that big H antenna is is a pain in the butt. So what you have to do is disconnect the box and put on what's there. Okay, what's called what we call a rubber ducky, which is just a smaller antenna, maybe six inches or long or so. And what they're going to do is body shield, which this person is doing by putting the antenna closer to the best mass of your body, which is usually your belly, you can uh, direct your signal. So as you turn and you start getting a signal, you know it's kind of out in front of you. As it declines, then you know it's in back of you. So that's how body shielding is done. Again, when you're doing body shielding, in your turns, do not make rapid turns. Do it slowly. And you'll be able to, as you turn, towards the signal, it'll start coming on, building in volume, and then if you start going too far the other direction, it'll start dropping off. So you can check things out that way, or just the opposite. As you lose the signal, you can say it's in back of you type of situation. That's body shielding. And as we described earlier, ELT signals can be heard greatly or not at all. Something's blocking it. In this case, it could be a mountain, it could be a cliff, it could be some trees even out there uh, where they'll reflect off of stuff or just block it completely. Right. So, so in this case, this uh, this ELT is in a little valley uh, between two mountains or hills. And so the signal is being channeled upward, but because of the density of the mountains, it, all that pink area um, means the signal is not getting to that area. So, you know, when you're when you're doing this, um, getting to high ground is is very useful in helping to kind of pick up signals. Um, you know, you, you try to try to take advantage of everything that you can possibly take take advantage of in just understanding the terrain you're working on, which means learning how to read a map is essential, right? To be able to 
uh, figure out what type of uh, obstacles that you have, where you may need to relocate in order to, you know, possibly get a bigger, better signal. You know, if you are, you know, if you got a, a valley in front of you, uh, you know, you may want to move to a point where you can shoot up and down the valley as opposed to um, you got ridges in between you and the valley. So just different ways of, of approaching that. This past weekend, we had a search and rescue exercise out of Cheyenne, and Colonel Carlson Mam took a ground team out to try to find an ELT. And I was devious enough to put it under an underpass. And so they had their radio on inside the vehicle driving along. And as they got closer, still no signal. They had to get within less than eighth of a mile before they heard the signal. And so the reason I did that was to see how well the signal got away from the mass of concrete and where the signal would be picked up. Can be achieving sometimes. Power lines are a big problem. Uh, we had a signal up in northern uh, Wyoming and slash Montana and I put the ELT in a tree about seven feet off the ground and it was under a 25 kilovolt power line and I had an aircraft trying to search the signal they were 40 miles away saying to me over the radio it is absolutely down there and they were 40 miles away and I said nope it's right here six feet from me so power lines fence lines can carry signals a long way and that's a trick that I use sometimes to see how well uh, people are able to discern the differences of signals if you put the antenna on a fence line, it can transmit a long distance. As stated before, reflections off of obstacles, it can be buildings, it could be mountains, trees. When you have an ELT going off in a hangar, sometimes uh, you, dependent on the mass of metal that's in there, somehow that signal gets out and will will uh, boggle your mind on where it's actually coming from, which hangar. If you have a moving target, that will even dis, uh, confuse you more. And if you don't know how to use your equipment and utilize it correctly, you can be walking off in the wrong direction. Next, so basically please. in this picture um, that's available, uh, they haven't expanded the antenna, so you know it's not it's not much service there. Yeah. So that's the antenna that's not working. Oh, okay. It's hard to see that one. <laughs> uh, so they say to try to overcome some of the problems, reflections, is check your sensitive sensitivity. Uh, using receive mode versus DF mode. Use the rubber ducky or a small one. I have been at Blue Beret trying to discern which aircraft uh, was sending off the signal since they're so packed together. And we went away from the H antenna and we didn't have a rubber ducky and we used a paper clip. And that acted a as enough as an antenna to get what we wanted. Uh, don't be afraid to go back. If things aren't working, don't continue on. Maybe go back and rethink and try to pick up that signal again and then go from there. Next. Ah, most important things. Figuring out where it is. <laughs> Triangulation. Well, I got a problem with this because most of the time we don't use tri. Tri means three, we use bi, biangulation. The biangulation you're going to, uh, as this person is doing, take the antenna and the person in his back is shooting an azimuth to the signal. Hopefully, you know where you are on your map so that you can go from a point of origin to a line that shows where the signal is going. By moving off in another direction, preferably somewhere 45 to 90 degrees different, 
you set up another location, take a bearing or an azimuth, and hopefully they cross. That's biangulation. If you take a third one, now you should uh, be able to have three lines coming together. And if they intersect exactly on the same point, oh boy, cool. But they never do. It ends up that you'll end up having a small search area because it will make a triangle within the system. So they show, what, uh, 150, or that's more than 90 degrees, but. No, they're 45 degrees on the one heading. Yep. And 150 degrees on the second heading. It's approximately 90. Can you do it by 10 degrees off? Yes, you could, but it's better to get some distance between the two times that you take it. And if you ask me what that distance is, it depends on the situation that we're dealing with. But uh, a, having an angle of approximately 90 degrees uh, difference and some distance between the two stationary points is better to get a better location. Next one, sir. All this stuff is good to talk about, but we got to make sure that uh, you have some hands-on time with your, your equipment. So what do you need to tell the incident commander? Once you've uh, found the ELT, you should do some recording, finding the make, the model, and the model number, the manufacturer, a location description. If you don't have a map that shows lat long or UTM, or you don't have a, a GPS, then by noting some prominent locations around you, like mountains or radio towers or something, and then getting azimuths back to that and putting it down in um, on paper so that when you finally get back you can have a good location on it. They can tr uh, plot it on a map. Should know the owner. If, if you don't know it, uh, at least get the tail number of the boat or excuse me, the tail number of the aircraft or if you got a name of the boat, or sometimes each state has a, a special number, record that down. And then for the find time. Pretty much everything we do and we report for the ground team is supposed to be in Zulu time. Zulu right now is uh, seven hours ahead of us. Come, what, 16 days from now, we're going to transfer, transfer over to uh, daylight savings time. So we spring ahead. By that means we lose an hour, so it'll be six hours difference. And then the shutoff time and how the unit is shut off, which I'm not sure if they'll explain, but uh, I think the there's different ways of doing it. I think they're in the old uh, NISA. There's, a, if you can't get into the aircraft to uh, turn it off, because you need to have permission to do that, there's a way to build a aluminum foil tent around the antenna by that blocking the signal so it doesn't get out so other people will hear it and report it in type of thing and cry wolf. Make sure when you build those aluminum foil antennas or packages around the antenna, make sure that the antenna does not touch the foil. Otherwise, it makes it even a better antenna if it does. Next one, sir. Uh, I think we, okay, yes, uh, some, I don't, if you're turning it off, you know where the switch position is, or you should be able to uh, draw a little picture and say, here's the unit that we had, 
and the on-off switch was here and we did turn it off. The manufacture date, uh, the, the battery expiration date, if we're looking for ELTs, there's a separate battery by itself. And according to FAA regulations, those batteries have to be replaced every two years. And then try to, uh, if, this one's a hard one. Uh, indicate the, ac the reason for the accident and the activation. We're not experts. The only people that I consider to be experts are the NTSB. And we can kind of say what we think, but we're, ours is not going to be the final. No, but, you know, I've, I've found uh, ELTs, you know, on a workbench, <laughs> still on. So, um, you know, you can say, hey, you know, it was removed from the aircraft. Uh, it was laying on a workbench and, you know, uh, and it was still on. So, you know, you, you try to provide as much information you can for AFRCC and, right. you know, they'll just say, yeah, okay. Um, my, my thoughts were a crash type of situation. but Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but, you know, some, you know, if it's parked in a hangar, um, you know, and it's still going off, you know, they could have had a hard landing and never turned it off, never noted it, you know, didn't follow their checklist, basically. And uh, one thing that I got to impress upon people, if you're in the situation where you're in a, a local area, hangars, buildings, and your signal is showing that you're going into a building, you do not have the right to enter the building without permission. You do not have the right to open up an aircraft to get inside to try to turn something off. What you need to do is to contact the individual who owns the um, apparatus. In this case, it could be a plane or a hangar. If you're at a hangar, it's good just to get in touch with the local uh, airport manager. And then they usually have keys to stuff or they have phone numbers they can call. If that's not the case, Always cover your butt by going back to the COM, to the IC, and uh, giving the information to them and let them go out and try to find whose uh, who's aircraft or whatever it may be and trying to get uh, permission to enter to uh, turn it off. We don't have the right to uh, try to disable something that is uh, private property. Next one, sir. We're almost done here. We're done. Okay. So basically today, um, you know, two of the tasks that we went over was talking about the uh, 301, uh, determine distressed beacon bearings and locating a distressed beacon. Uh, we talked about, you know, the triangulation and biangulation, and, you know, those are, those are probably the essential pieces to this. Um, there was a lot of background information, you know, good information to have in your head, but um, really it comes out to setting one of these things up and going and trying it. So remember, you know, make sure that it's set for DF, you're chasing the needle, um, you know, turn around once to make sure that you, in fact, that the, the needle is in the right direction. Um, you know, so that it's in front of you and not behind you. Uh, you know, just basic things like that. But, but really it comes down to actually getting it in your hands, getting in the field, but hopefully, you know, you have a, a little more information on, you know, what this idea of direction finding is about. Um, now it's a matter of getting with a good trainer, going out there and trying it, and, and trying, you know, starting with easy problems, so you, so you build a sense of confidence and then just make the problems more challenging. So that way, if you're needed in an emergency, um, you know, you can go out and, you know, just knock this thing out and uh, go out and save lives. And that's what this thing is all about. So. And as the colonel stated, it's practice, practice, practice. It's uh, utilizing, a, you're trying to develop an art because when these signals come in, you have to utilize previous 
experiences to try to um, get through the problem of why things aren't working. I, I would have those when I was early on trying to uh, discern this stuff. I was going all sorts of different directions. But I've only been able to be, uh, become better through practice. I wanted to also reflect that besides the Elper and the Tracker and the other one that we have, what's called the Canadian model that we use for DF equipment, if good, there are good pilots out there, they carry an extra handheld radio with them that has radio frequency or aircraft radio frequencies on it. I utilize that quite a bit in my training because I'm a pilot and I've also taught at NISA both the ground teams and the air crews and reflect to them it all depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get in down and dirty then a handheld radio utilizing what every pilot should have in their case can utilize that body blocking and go out and find it. If they need, the, when they're in the aircraft, they're never going to have to worry about going long distance on the ground because they're flying. So that's why ground teams utilize the, uh, the Elper. Knowing what each unit does in its capacities is what brings you up to the expert level of how to find something. It's an art, and practice, practice, practice gets you there. Thank you, sir. Very good, very good. All right, so we are going to um, move on to our next set of topics. And um, basically, this is all talking about um, going out and being part of a line search, uh, moving part of a line search, uh, how to communicate with other members using whistle signals, you know, attraction techniques, a variety of different things like that. So that's uh, the second part of our training this morning. And, um, you know, once again, you know, even in this training, there, what we're talking about is, is more theory and concepts but the only way to do this is to actually get on a team, get out there in the field, and go ahead and practice this stuff. Um, so we encourage you to do that. But uh, without further ado, um, we'll turn you over to uh, Colonel B.J. Carlson. So let me make sure that we're tracking. Yep, line searches. All right, cooking with propane. So. Um, Colonel Carlson, turn it over to you. Okay. Actually, this uh, slide set will take care of almost all of the other uh, ground team prerequisite or the uh, required training for ground team three. I think the only thing it doesn't cover is using a signal mirror and how to uh, keep a log. So, uh, and and then their participation in a hasty search and a litter carry. So you, this will talk about a lot of different uh, things. So if you want to go ahead to the first slide. Absolutely. Okay. They're saying that there's about three basic search formations, a hasty, the line, and the wedge, and they're going to be talking about those on the next slide, so go ahead and go to the next slide. A hasty search is basically that. It's hasty. It's quick. Uh, you're looking at a place uh, where you think that you might have a good possibility of finding something, a person, aircraft, whatever. You are looking at perhaps a river drainage, perhaps a trail, something that is pretty obvious, maybe a, a, a tower of some sort that you've seen in the distance. You want to go and check it out, see if anybody's gone there. You're going to places where you think people might be. So you generally have a small team. Here they say, you know, maybe your assistant team leader or someone with calm and maybe a, a medic person, a person who knows a little bit more about first aid, and you send them off. You're, you're in contact with that person, hopefully by radio, and maybe you have more than one team going out. Perhaps you have a couple of places that you want to check. So they're out. You send them out with specific directions. You say, okay, go check this out. You report back to me or go out for five minutes and come back if you don't see anything. So it's just a hasty search. Okay, go ahead. 
uh, here they're talking about uh, different uh, people that you might have on your search team. So you might have some real experienced people, then you might have some inexperienced members. You always have to have someone with communication, so you always want to have a radio. You always hopefully have somebody that has some first aid knowledge, someone who's navigating and assistant team leader. Here in Wyoming, we're lucky if we can get uh, you know maybe three of those. So, and then of course the ground team leader. You never want to go out without a ground team leader and at least three um, either experienced or in trainee people. Go ahead. So they're talking first about the line search. This is basically you're in a straight line, and they've they've loc they've put different people according to the letters from the previous slide on different ways that you could set up a search line. It is a slow search. It's very detailed. You're scanning the area around you, and you kind of keep in you know, close proximity usually, depending on what you're searching for. And you might be really close together. You might be fairly far apart, but you're searching a very uh, an area very thoroughly. I'm gonna go on to the next one. It's uh, okay. The wedge, which I believe, if you just show them um, the next slide there, a uh, wedge is, yeah, oh, there you go. So some different options. You have your navigator up in front. Your leader often is at the rear, making sure that the line is going where it's supposed to go. And you put your most experienced people there, it looks like, on the outside, and less experienced maybe in the middle. And you're basically, again, searching the area thoroughly but it's a little bit faster than the line search. Yeah, it looks like you have more people too that are able to do that. Um, so you have more, more area that you can cover. So go ahead to the next one. So there's some different search patterns that you can do. You can have a parallel sweep, an expanding square, circle, and a contour. And they'll show some pictures of those on the next slides. So a parallel sweep is basically what it's looking like here. You go down one side, you go over, you go back up and down and up and down, and you're thoroughly covering it. And later on in these slides, they'll talk about marking the route so you remember where you were and so you don't search the same area more than once. And you generally, they say, for this kind of a parallel sweep, you're using a line search formation. And go ahead and go down to the next slide which would be the expanding square or circle. So you're starting at a known kind of a point where you think maybe you've seen a vehicle of the person and you want to then expand out around that vehicle to see if you can find any indication of where that person might have gone. So they're saying here that you normally use a hasty team search, uh, but somehow you are just searching that area right around and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger, either in a circle or a square. And then the last one, I believe, is a contour search. And this is especially uh, good in, in mountainous terrain or hilly terrain because you're kind of searching along the contour rather than going up and down and up and down and wearing out your ground team members. You kind of start from the top, hopefully, and kind of angle your people down the down the hill or down the mountain and you're kind of following the contours. It makes it a lot easier to walk and, uh, and you want to angle your searchers so that someone up at the top isn't, uh, isn't knocking debris and stones and things down on the other search members. And here they're saying you're normally looking for hikers along trails or along the sides of trails. You don't never know. You maybe you have a, a kind of a steep terrain that you need to check out, and so you don't want to walk the contours rather than trying to walk up and down. And they're saying to use that wedge formation for this pattern. Again, the leader will determine what kind of a pattern is going to be used. So you, as a ground team member, need to follow the leader's direction. So. If you know those three types of, of uh, if you, yeah, like hasty, uh, wedge, and line, if you know kind of how to be in that formation, then all what you need to do is be following what that leader is saying and, and do that. So I want to talk just a little bit. They don't really, in this slide set, they don't really get into um, scanning techniques as far as when you're actually out there doing this 
what you should be doing. So I'm going to refer back to the training guidelines in the uh, in the booklet for ground team. So when you're talking about going on on foot and you're scanning, you want to make sure that you're scanning the entire area in front of you and to your left and to your right. And the other person next to you is probably going to overlap a little bit, which is good. That's fine because that means you're not going to miss uh, an area when you're searching for it. You want to make sure that if you have terrain or trees or bushes or something that is might be blocking something that you're searching around, under, behind those objects. It's a good idea to look behind you. Things look differently when you look behind and you you might see something different. Uh, if someone, if you're searching for a small child, small children tend to want to hide. And no matter what you do, how much noise you make, they're, they're afraid of strangers. They're not going to come out. But if you look behind or look and underneath something, you might find someone hiding. So it's really important to be very thorough when you're searching. You want to look up into the tree branches if you're in the wooded area. You might find a indications of an airplane um, shearing off part of the tree or leaving a part of debris. You just never know what you're going to find. So look up, down, and around whenever you're searching. You want to make sure that you're stopping every once in a while listening for clues because uh, it'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the um, finding aircraft and missing person clues. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. And then if you are searching at night, uh, you want to make sure you have like a red light on versus a white light. And it's going to be a little harder searching at night because you're not going to see uh, things as clearly, obviously, as you do in the daylight. So they say do not stare at any one spot for too long. Again, use uh, do not use white light, but use you know maybe blue or red. And uh, be very alert to any movement or noise that you might hear. So again, stopping and listening, using your senses to figure out where the person might be. Okay. Okay. Um, where are we, Colonel Scrabbit? As far as uh, okay. Are you just typing in and adding some things there? <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Before we get into this missing person search clues, I want to talk one other thing about um, moving as part of a search line. Again, the team leader will determine what your search line is going to look like and what you are going to be doing. So how, how far apart you are, uh, what kind of signals they want, but the search line will have a direction of movement and it's going to be guided by your navigator saying this is the compass bearing we want to go on or it's going to be guided by a terrain feature maybe like a road or a trail or some sort of a mark line left by another team or by your team and the team leader again will be uh, you know, in charge of, of that. The search lines move as fast as the slowest searcher so you don't want to get your team all spread out. You want to keep them together otherwise you might end up with a lost team member, someone misplaced and then you'll have to go and search for them and you do not want to, it's very embarrassing to lose a, a team member so try not to do that and that last the person who might be the slowest might be the person who's marking the route. Do we have to wait for that person? So that, that's one of the hardest things to do is to keep that um, that search line in the in the confines of what you want as a team leader. So uh, let's see, what else are they saying here? You don't have any slides. I know I don't have any slides. I'm not talking about this. No slides on this one. So, okay. And they're saying that you don't have to keep an absolutely straight line as you walk, but uh, Obviously, it's really hard to do when you're looking down the ground. It's really hard to keep a straight line. But you need to be aware of the person to either side of you and to try and stay in the, ver in the approximate or the, the proximity of that person. And if somebody stops, you probably need to stop. Kind of use the buddy system, too, if you're, um, you need to. Stay. 
No, he's still there. He's just adding. He's adding a slide. <laughs> I think is what he's doing. So, and any team member may halt the line for safety or a possible clue or finds. And we'll talk about that a little bit later about what happens when you actually find a clue. Okay, those are the, some of the things, Colonel Scrabbit, that I just wanted to put in that I noticed that they did not have in. Oh, here's one other thing about communicating to other members on the search line. It's okay to talk. You should be talking about what your task is, not about what you're going to do next weekend you know, with your girlfriend or boyfriend or something. But you, um, you uh, can, can talk to other people. And we'll talk more about uh, those kind of signals in a little bit later on. So let's go ahead and talk about missing person search clues. These slides are fairly comprehensive. You're going to be looking for some physical clues, you know, maybe clothing or equipment that the person might have discarded, perhaps some smoke, uh, maybe they've built a fire. So you're, that's why you're using your senses. You're using your sight, you're using your smell. You're going to look for food wrappers, trash, or cigarette butts, things that are probably fairly recently discarded, not things that are really old. Don't be you know, saying that a, a pop can that's probably been in the woods for five years is going to be a, a missing person search clue, unless that person's been missing for five years. So you want to look for broken or disturbed brush or footprints, those kinds of things. Hopefully you don't have to look for scavengers and decomposition odors, which means that that person has been out there for a while and is now um, to the is being fed on, so that be the person would be dead at that point, and hopefully that won't won't happen. Okay, what's on the next one? I'll grab it. Okay, you might be able to if you're if you're in a trail system, there might be a place where a person had to sign in to go on the trail, and so make sure you look at those things. Uh, maybe that person did sign in or even signed out, so you'll know all oh, that person might still be on this trail, so that would be a good place then to search. If you see other people in the area, uh, you want to ask them, have you seen so-and-so, or do you know of anybody, have you seen anybody on this trail? Uh, if you have forest rangers available, family and friends, you want to get as much information as you can from other people so that you can hopefully find your missing person as fast as possible. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, now they're going into missing aircraft search clues. And again, you're looking for broken or disturbed trees or underbrush, things that just don't look right, something that looks like it was man-made uh, of some sort, not, not just something natural. A landslide might be a terrain change. Horse tails caused by windblown snow or sand. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Um, yeah, basically um, for that is if if you have something that's under the snow, <coughs> and as the wind is blowing it, it's you know it's basically drifting and you know just something that maybe out in the middle of the field, some you know that that you notice you've got just a, a strange. Um, you know, wind blown effect. Mm -hmm. you know, Maybe something worth looking into. Okay, that makes sense. It, like I said, anything that doesn't look natural, so any break in terrain that doesn't look natural, go and check it out. Blackened or discolored areas, you're going to, you know, go check it out. See if that's something. Maybe it's just a, someone had a fire pit. But maybe it is something that the aircraft has, you know, burned along the way. Perhaps there's a burn trail. Smoke, and again, presence of scavengers. They're, they're the first ones to get in there and take advantage of anything that they can. So you need to be watching for those kinds of things. Okay, so that's some terrain things. Smells, you're gonna, you might smell smoke. You might smell decomposition odors or fuel, oil, or brake fluid, anything that is, again, not natural to the environment that you're in. And of course, aircraft signs, pieces of wreckage, fluids, and metal pieces that you might see. Um, <coughs> most people who have been in Civil Air Patrol for a while and have been on searches, either from the air or on the ground, can tell you that most airplanes don't look like airplanes once they've crashed. 
So you are looking for probably small pieces. Sometimes you will find big pieces and you can really tell that it's an aircraft, but other times you might not. So it's amazing what will happen when uh, something man-made hits the ground. And is there anything else on this one, Colonel Scrabbit? Okay, and then of course signs of people. So clothing, any trail markings, footprints, campfires, any garbage or signals. So be, be aware if the person has survived the crash, they're going to try and get attention from somebody. So signal flares uh, or mirrors, using mirrors to uh, attract the attention of another aircraft or anybody who might be looking for them. You know, building a fire, a smoke fire would probably be even better, you know, because you could, you could smell the smoke and probably see the smoke and any garbage. And then any unusual events like listen for voices, listen for creaking metal, listen for anything that doesn't sound ordinary at that point. Yeah, and that's that's kind of important. You know, you mentioned you know the, on the search line people being able to talk and such. Um, you know, when I run a search line personally, uh, I prefer that they don't, simply for these reasons, so that they're focusing on their sense of hearing, and and listening for, you know, other sounds out there. And and if they're sitting there gabbing their mouth, um, <laughs> they tend to to not hear those things. So. That's just a personal preference for me when I run a team. So. Right. And I guess I was thinking more of it would be pertinent to the search. You know, if right. they were saying, yeah. well, what do you think about this or whatever, you know, but not just, like I said, talking about uh, their date last night or what they're going to have for supper tonight or right. things like right. that. <laughs> okay. As you're moving in the search line, there are certain voice commands or whistle commands that you need to follow. Uh, these two are pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. If the team leader says forward the line, you move forward. If you halt the line, you halt. So generally, if you have a small search line, uh, voice commands work really well. Uh, you can everybody be able to hear you. When your line gets a little longer, it's it's a little harder to manage. So you might want to tra uh, switch over to a whistle signal. Uh, sometimes what we do is we'll say ready on the ready on the left, and the person way on the left will say ready, and you know ready on the right, ready, and then you then you know your your line's ready to go so that they don't miss anything. They just go forward the line. Anybody can halt the line, and people should halt the line if they're noticing if they notice something that they think might be a clue. They can halt the line if there's something unsafe that's happening. Anybody or if if uh, they're noticing that a team member is having difficulty. Anybody can halt the line. What we generally, what I try to say to my people if I'm doing a, a search line is if somebody says halt the line, everybody but that person goes down on one knee. That way the team leader can easily identify who has said halt the line. And, um, you know, because when you're out in the field, sounds carry, so it's hard to, hard to figure out who has said that. And that way the team leader can go right to that person and say, okay, what, what's the deal? What, did you find something? And carry on the business from that. Okay? And I believe the next slide is going to talk about whistle signals. Very, very simple also. If you, if you hear one short whistle signal, that means you're going to forward the line. You're going to go. Two short, stop. Three short is the universal signal for SOS or anything dangerous. So, um, so here they say danger, but keep moving unless you encounter a problem that you must stop for. Uh, generally, when I hear three, when I I tell my team members three short, stop, and we'll figure out what the problem is. Let's not keep going <laughs> because obviously, if somebody thought it was dangerous enough to do three short uh, whistle signals, I would want to check it out before continuing. Then if you hear one long whistle signal, that means to assemble on the team leader. Usually it's be the team leader who's doing this, not, not a team member. So that might mean, okay, we're done with the search, or I need to, we need to reassemble, or we, maybe we need to take a break or something. So you'll just remember, one short, two short, three short, and one long. Pretty easy. Yeah, and, and really, you know, I, I, from my experiences, you know, you're trying to keep the the team um, where the distance between team members is manageable based on the terrain that you're in. If you're in a wide open field looking for a 747, you can have people spread out pretty far. But if you are, you know, in 
heavy forest with lots of underbrush, your team members are going to be more close together. Uh, and you should be able to see your team members. Um, and if they're really close together, then you're probably not using whistle signals. Um, you know, you're, you're basically talking to them. If you have so many people, and, and your team shouldn't be overly large, you know, 10 to 15 at the most, uh, if you've got more than that, you may want to split them up into two teams uh, and, and stagger them um, so you have one team that just overlaps a little bit behind the other team. Uh, that way you can cover more area, uh, and, but also managing your team, so things to think about. Right, that is good. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a search line and you come upon what you think might be a clue or might actually be the target that you're looking for. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is call a halt, either with a verbal or your two, uh, two whistles signals. You alert that, so that alerts the team leader. They're saying looking for any hazards in the area. You want to be careful. If, you've, if you're looking for a downed aircraft, you might have some hazards that you have to worry about. The important thing is to not disturb anything. You want to keep the place as pristine as possible or the clue that you found as pristine as possible. You never pick it up and say, hey, I found something. You leave it right where it is. You're going to probably tag it and I believe that's going to be on the next clue or, or the next slide. But um, you tell the team leader what you found, and then we're going to mark that area and call it in. We're going to call in probably to Mission Base. We're going to definitely note it on the log, and we're going to probably give a, a latitude, longitude line uh, designation so that someone can go back and find it. And Colonel Scrabbit is the next slide talking about marking it. Oh, they talk about marking a route. Okay. So uh, that, as a ground team member, as a GTM3, you do not necessarily have to worry about marking the things. That's a team leader's job, pretty much. I mean, they can direct you on how to do it, but again, you follow your directions on your, from your team leader on what you do. But you basically do not want to touch the, the clue. You want to just note it. Um, again, the log person is noting it. We're calling it in if necessary and um, making sure that we keep it um, in place. So when you're on a team and you're searching, it's very, very easy to research an area you've already searched unless you somehow uh, mark your route, <laughs> which is really easy. I, I've done practice uh, deals with uh, cadets and other team members where I throw a bunch of coins out on the ground and it's amazing how hard it is to find pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and I've lost several coins along the way when I do this because we were so busy searching for it that we forget where we've walked so it's real important that we have our t person on either end, whichever way we're going on our search. So let's say we're going to be doing a search that's going to go from left to right on the terrain in front of you. So your person on the left side will mark where you've been. Uh, well, well, actually, when you first start, you'll have probably that person, both end persons marking the route. So that you kind of know where you've been. And then when you turn around, all you have to do then is follow the line that that person has set out the person probably on the right. So you go all the way down to the end of your search area, you wheel around and then you come back down and then that person who is now on the right who had set the things can now follow the, the markings that that person is just, that he, is, he or she has just put down. And then the person on the other end will be marking the route along the way so that when you wheel around again you can figure out where where you've already been. And I believe the next slide, oh, okay, the next slide is going to talk about suggested route markings. So just one strand is just your temporary edge of your search pattern. And then uh, two strands would be the outside edge of your search pattern. So that would what would be the first person would be doing. They'd be marking your outside edge, the, the person on the left. person on the right is just going to take and just quickly tie a uh, one strand and so that 
that when they wheel around, he can then follow, he or she can follow where they've already been. And then three strands you could use for uh, if you actually found a clue. So you could put down the time and date on one thing, you could put the clue number, team ID, say ground team one, ground team two, whatever you are, whatever you're being identified as, so that someone can then go back and figure out. You want to put those markings at um, at eye level when possible. Makes it a little hard when you're dealing with sagebrush. It can't always be at eye level. But um, you want to be able to see them. You don't want to have it buried. And um, again, the person who's marking the route might need a little bit more time to actually tie those on. So keep your keeping that team together. The team members need to kind of slow down to match the pace of that. And as far as how far apart you mark, a person would mark it would be depending on your terrain. If it's really wide open terrain where you can see easily, you don't need to leave as many markers. Uh, but if you're in heavy woods, you might need to mark quite frequently so that you can follow your path on the way back out. Okay. Um, night marking. You want to talk about night marking? <laughs> Colonel Carlson mentioned about night marking. I've never done this, so I don't know. <laughs> With a Park County Search and Rescue, we're a 24-7 operation. We just don't always operate in the daylight hours. So we've been out at night quite a few times. Utilizing fl uh, marking, flagging marking is, is good, but Understand that it's harder to see with flashlights at night, especially if you're using red. What we've gone to is taking some popsicle sticks and going out and get some reflective uh, tape, which you can get at a hardware store, and just uh, wrap it around and being able to secure it to different things. Maybe it's in the ground, maybe it's uh, on a tree or a bush, so that when your light hits it, you'll be able to see the reflection at night. Some people have decided to uh, take that reflective tape when they're out and take their flagging tape and attach the two together. If it's secured in a tree line and there's a bit of a wind, you can actually see that a lot easier as it's moving. You'll catch it. There's, uh, we've resorted to utilizing some pins. We'll take a... Uh, 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 paper clips, wrap it around one end, and then be able to uh, stick it into a tree or branch. Uh, we use uh, sticks or laths or, uh, to, uh, again, use a reflective tape. We go to a different assortment. In our packs for search and rescue, we carry those popsicle sticks, and each member should have about 10. So that way, if you have a group of people and you have a long way to go, each contribute so we don't all have to have 20 or 30 just to uh, get the mission accomplished at night. Hey, Mike, night. you know, one, one idea that you may have instead of, well, instead of popsicle sticks or, or is using clothespins. Yes, we, we use that also. That's another one. Uh, we use a variety of different methods to uh, enhance whatever light we're using at night. Uh, popsicle sticks are a little bit easier and less cumbersome than, than uh, pay, uh, clothespins, but we do have that in our what we call our go kit for the vehicle. We have an assortment of different styles, and it all depends on how or where we're going to be searching. Uh, sometimes you need to uh, make sure that if you're the lead team heading out before the main body comes is to make sure that those signals of where to turn or, or are you following the right path are visible. Otherwise, you can take the main body and have them go elsewhere. So it's something to think about, which CAP doesn't uh, put into their presentations, is some nighttime reflecting type of material that you can use to help out the rest of the group. You know, in Pennsylvania, one of the things that we would do is, you know, if we knew that we had to uh, go search a specific grid area, um, you know, they'd give us a square to go search. 
at night, we would have a night navigation team that would go mark that out, just doing what you're saying, and, and basically mark out the boundary so it would speed up the process for our daytime team to oh. actually go do the search. Yep. I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the slide that's up right now just basically talks about what well, I was saying about marking the route. Uh, the outside edge is marked with that, the two strands. The clues are marked with three. And then the temporary edge. So you've started up the right-hand side. You're going to go along, wheel around, and then come down the other side. And the WXXCL, XXW is just the way that they've set up their search line. Generally, this is, this is a you know, parallel search again, obviously. And um, I think that's about all they talk about. So unless we have any yeah, so so in this parallel search, what they're showing is as they are coming back down to the bot towards the bottom of the slide, you have one team that's going out and marking the route. The other team is following the markings and picking them up, so you don't leave a, a forest full of litter. Right. You know, as they're heading back. Yeah, those temporary ones, you can go ahead and take it apart, and then the other end is marking the route of or your uh, line on the other side. Right, I forgot to mention that. Thank you, Colonel. That's what the wheels Yeah. Okay, um, another thing that you can do if you're looking for a lost person is uh, do some attraction techniques. Shouting the person's name, letting them know that you're out there. You know, you don't have to stay quiet. Honking vehicle horns, uh, using a public address system. I'm not sure exactly why you'd have that out on a search line, but uh, you never know. You might have a bullhorn of some sort that you could uh, call out the person's name. One other thing that they don't mention on this slide that is in the book is doing a sound sweep, where you uh, all the members blow their whistles for about 15 seconds, and then you everybody is quiet and listening for about a minute to see if they hear anything in response which would be a very good thing to do if someone has can yell or, or has a whistle with them or something we might be able to hear them. Uh, light attractions, building a fire, especially at night would be awesome, using flashlights, headlights. Uh, let's see what else they could say here. Um, using car headlights during vehicle searches, hanging signs that direct the lost person towards your camp. Uh, so there are any ways that you can attract attention to yourself being in there for the person. It says over there, you can find a victim by helping them find you. So you don't have to be super quiet uh, when you're searching for a lost person if indeed you want to be calling out their name. And we've done that for Park County Search and Rescue when we've flagged a route or area if we believe that the person is mobile. And we'll do the out, whatever edges we need to get done. We'll flag and then put actual directions if, if found what that person needs to do, i.e. head in this direction with the point of an arrow or something on the ground that uh, they can actually... Uh, rescue themselves in that case by leaving out per, uh, outside boundaries or parameters. Okay, I believe that the next two or the next slide, couple slides, are talking about confinement methods. Uh, I, they don't even have this task that's listed um, down below. Is not even in the book anymore. Um, so I wasn't familiar with this, but I believe it's just talking about. You know, if you're searching in an area, you kind of confine it. You kind of say, okay, we're going to, here's our main road. That could be our left hand uh, boundary. I don't have any idea what a track trap is or a string line. I'm not quite sure what they're talking about here. Uh, so if either of you know what this is talking about, feel free to jump in. I don't know what they mean well, by Well, you know, the string lines, um, you know, basically that's taking like 550 cord and running it in a straight line from, you know, as they show on the next map, you know, from a trail to, you know, the main road. And what it is is if someone is lost in that wooded area and they run into that string, um, they would follow it either one way or another. Um, 
That's you know, what I just explained. Yeah, exactly. So what's a track trap? That I don't know. <laughs> okay. And I couldn't find it in the book, so I couldn't get any explanation on that. So I'm not quite sure but, what, what they're talking about. What that means is if you're on a track, you would set up uh, a V if you wanted to and to stop them. That V could be tree branches. It could be a sketch in the ground to say, okay, stop here, hmm. and then leave instructions on what to do. Okay, well, I'm not positive, but I guess use whatever you can to try and find the person that you're looking for and help them out. Uh, well, here, I've just pulled up um, a guide that talks about track traps. Hold on, let me okay. find that. A track trap is a spot where you'll capture the fact that a person passed through the area. So, for example, if you walk along a beach, you leave footprints. Even if you cover your tracks, there's still evidence that somebody had passed through the area. There are many natural track traps, which include rivers, stream banks, trails with excessive mud or dust. Um, so, however, an area is prone to lost person searches, like national parks, it is not unheard of of SAR teams to build track traps along major trails to help search efforts. They may bring in a load of sand and place it in a low spot along the trail. This sand pit captures a record of anyone passing down the trail. Then if a search develops, the trained trackers in the area can immediately go to these known track traps and compare the prints against a known print of a lost person. Huh. So, okay. so basically they'll rake out the area so it's, it's pristine, and then if anyone walks across it, um, you know which direction they went. Oh, okay. Well, learn that something cool. new. Yeah. <laughs> Never too old to learn something new. <clears throat> I believe there's only one slide left on this, um, and that's just talking about some pros and cons. Uh, hasty search, just kind of to review, uh, is kind of an initial search, really quick. Unfortunately, it could destroy clues because you're going kind of quickly. And then the line search is useful for finding um, very small things, and it's more man-intensive and time-intensive, and can be a little bit more difficult to manage, but it is probably more um, successful in finding things if you're looking for, like, air, aircraft clues or missing person clues. And the other uh, slides just kind of talk about the different tasks in the ground team task guide that this slide show covered, plus I added some of the moving as a search line because I didn't feel that they had carried uh, covered it quite as well as what they could have and communicating uh, communicating to other members of the search line also so look at those tasks to kind of refresh your memory and look to see what the uh, guidelines are for passing those things and uh, practice 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 get out on on uh, search lines and practice that's a lot of what ground team 3 is all about thank you so much very good, very good. Hey, I want to thank the couple of folks that happened to actually be with us today, Josh and we have a Robert McKinney out there. So I appreciate you guys uh, coming out and joining us. And um, let's, uh, hey, this is back to me. Uh, okay, so anyways, I think a good, um, we covered a lot of area today. So if you're just getting into the ground team member three business, um, take a moment to go through this presentation. Um, of course, this is at the end of the presentation, so how would you know? Um, but uh, we we enjoyed this, so we're going to probably continue this type of training. Um, we have a lot of different areas to cover. We have mission scanners, mission observers, more ground team. Um, we have a lot of mission staff skills to work on. So, yeah, we'll probably be in this business for a while. And I think uh, it just puts together a good library uh, that people can reference back to naturally. Um, the way you may have been trained, you may see some differences. Um, there's a lot of experience out there. There's a lot of people who have done different things different ways. Um, there's a just open your uh, you know keep an empty cup 
um, you can learn something from everyone. Don't don't get locked in saying this is the absolute way. Um, the more that you learn about this business, uh, the more skills that you can bring to the table, and our ultimate goal is to help people. So, um, you know, keep an open mind. So, if you have a different way, a uh, better way of doing it, um, feel free to share. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we're always looking to learn, also. So, uh, with that, I want to thank uh, Colonel Mike and BJ Carlson's. Uh, Great job, and thanks for helping out with this training. Spreading the wealth is always fun. Good enough, sir. All right. Well, I'm going to close this broadcast. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. And uh, thanks for attending. Bye for now.